Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. It is a Monday. It is going to be a become a very, very snowy Monday uh, for the northeast part of the country. And uh, just as, as we speak right now, we're beginning to get a fairly good, fairly good uh, uh, bit of snow coming down right now. It's just beginning here. We're not going to get, apparently, uh, anywhere near what's going to happen up north of us, but... Uh, uh, we're supposed to get a couple of inches out of this, and and it's beginning now uh, here in the uh, southern West Virginia area uh, in in Beckley, and uh, so uh, I guess it's I guess it's going to be real. Uh, Mayor De Blasio of New York is referring to this as potentially the biggest storm that the city of New York has ever had to deal with, and uh, I know from uh, friends in Boston, um, it looks like the the Massachusetts and the New England area is set to get pounded. So um, I hope I, I, you know, I just hope that uh, that everybody is safe. And please, uh, uh, you know, if you're in that area and you're and you're listening, uh, don't forget to check on other folks, especially folks that need to be checked on that might, uh, you know, that might have difficulty uh, getting out or getting food or or whatever. So. Uh, it's a good idea to check on those that need checking on, and especially in a in a weather situation like this. Uh, today is uh, the 26th day of uh, January. Um, this is the last week of January. Monday is, of course, besides being Super Bowl Sunday, is the 1st of February. So when we get together at this time next week, uh, we'll be into the second month of 2015. Uh, but today is uh, is a Monday. It is a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, I want to mention that we had a little bit of uh, a little bit of illness to deal with on Wednesday, and that's the reason why we didn't do a a live program on Wednesday. But I think everything is is well today. Uh, I do want to make sure that everybody has the phone number, and I want to encourage you to call in. And uh, um, I received a uh, a call on my cell phone before we went on the air, and it it uh, it appears that we're going to be hearing from one of our listeners uh, not too long into the program today, uh, about uh, ten after the hour. So um, I'm looking forward to that. But let me make sure that everybody has the phone number. Um, and obviously, if you would like to respond uh, uh, on the issues that we've been dealing with or in the issue that we will be dealing with today, um, if indeed our caller does call in, um, by all means, feel free to do that. Our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. 304-663-4676. And as you know, 4676 translates into HORN, H-O-R-N. If you would like to communicate directly with me via email, I would love to hear from you. My email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. I mentioned uh, that in about five or six minutes, uh, we're scheduled to receive a call from Wayne, who's one of our regular listeners. And from what I understand, the issue, uh, the issue on the on the dais on the agenda, uh, will be the issue of prevailing wage um, and what prevailing wage is, uh, what is happening to the issue of prevailing wage here in the state of West Virginia as a result of last November's elections here in West Virginia. Uh, I know that uh, Wayne has called in to Bob uh, Kincaid's program in the evening. I believe he called in uh, late last week. But I encouraged him uh, to to call in uh, during our uh, program of the with the virtual center 
primarily because I, I anticipate that there are a number of listeners out there who perhaps are not regular listeners to the horn in the evening, uh, who were not perhaps not available when Wayne called in in the evening program. I, I'm guessing that we have maybe not a totally different audience in the in the daytime if we broadcast it's 1 p.m. in the in the eastern time zone right now but um, at the same time there may be different listeners and I, I encourage Wayne plus the fact I think the the seriousness of the issue uh, warrants as much attention uh, as we can give to it uh, just as a you know as kind of an introduction to what I think is a very very serious uh, issue here uh, in the controversy over prevailing wage. I remind you that this, the, this program is a, is a center for the study, a virtual center for the study of the Constitution and civic responsibility. And we've been focusing throughout our, our time together on the issue of civic responsibility uh, with the idea that while many people emphasize rights, individual rights in our republic, uh, we've been emphasizing as well that with citizenship in a republic goes uh, a significant amount of responsibility in a number of different areas. But there's absolutely no question that one of the features of a republic is ultimately to make decisions that are in the public interest rather than private interest. And it seems to me that this is one of the areas, one of the perspectives that we can consider in, in looking at the issue of prevailing wage. And I don't want to get into the subject itself because I want to leave that to our, to our caller. But there's absolutely no question that when you, when you set out to make a significant change in an issue like this, it seems to me, you are engaged in the kind of change which has a direct impact on the public interest, on significant numbers of people in this republic. And it seems to me that that requires informed people, not indoctrinated people, but informed people. And it seems to me that while we are getting a, a, a tremendous amount of rationale about change, and I'm sure our caller, I'm sure Wayne will get into to get into some of this when he calls. The fact of the matter is, there are benefits, there are reasons why legislation governing the paying of prevailing wage salaries uh, in projects, especially construction projects, there are reasons why this legislation was adopted. And so when you're talking about adopting such legislation or when you're talking about removing that kind of legislation, you are talking about issues that directly affect the public interest. And one of the things that we know here at the Virtual Center, because we've been back to it over and over and over again, is the fact that a key feature that helps us understand the nature of Republican government is the willingness of individuals and groups to put aside self-interest for the benefit of the public interest. That as much as possible, the public interest and concern for the public interest, focus on the public interest, is what must govern the activities in a republic. And... I would suggest that this particular issue um, touches that subject front and center. It's a direct relationship, it seems to me. Uh, we know, for example, that there's nothing in the Constitution of the United States uh, as, as written by the founders to recognize the right of, of workers to unionize and organize. Um, however, there, there was legislation, as you know, passed in the late 19th and early 20th century, and of course, especially during the New Deal, um, which granted organized labor the right to organize. 
uh, the right to collective bargain and all the all the rest of it. Um, and so basically what we're talking about here are ideological issues and ideological concerns that directly affect the rights of not just hundreds of folks but thousands of folks. So it seems to me that uh, uh, that when a major effort is made to either add or remove something significant on an issue this important, the more light of day we can shine on it, it seems to me, the better off we will be. Hey, uh, Dr. Bill? Yes, Bob? I just thought I'd let you know that uh, Wayne is on the line. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Bob, very much. And you feel free to participate in this discussion as well. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you, Bob. Wayne, how are you, my friend? I'm very good, Dr. Bill, very good. Oh, it's good to hear from you. Um, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you were able to hear anything that I said about prevailing wage, but I was trying to talk about the subject without getting into the subject because I wanted to let you do that. Okay. So why don't you why don't you just just bring us up to speed and then we can we can all respond. Well, uh, we've been you know I, I believe Davis Bacon I think was passed in nineteen I think thirty one, and that is the federal prevailing wage law, and Davis uh, Senator Davis and Senator Bacon. I get confused which one. One was from Pennsylvania, one was from uh, New York. They were mm-hmm. both Republican senators. Yes. And I think it was Bacon was upset that they were building a veterans hospital in New York, and the low bidder on the project was like a, from Alabama or way out of state, and they brought in a lot of low-skilled, uh, you know, probably undocumented workers. Yes. And he felt that the, you know, that the job should go to the local people. Right. So they established the Davis Bacon Act, which said, said that you, if when you bid a publicly funded project, you have to pay the wages that prevail in that area. No okay. matter where you're from. And, and at past. In 1932, West Virginia and multiple states uh, passed similar laws that were referred to as many Davis Bacon. Uh-huh. And what that did was include not just federal projects, but any state-funded project. Any publicly funded project by the state was now included under prevailing wage. And that has been our law since 1932. Can I, can I ask year, you? Go ahead. I was just going to, can I ask you a question here? Uh, just in case, just in case there's, there are people out there that really aren't uh, totally aware of what the significance of prevailing wage is. You said must pay the prevailing wage in the area. What does that mean in terms of the ability of a of a contractor to bid on a public project, is that does well, that mean that that additional uh, cost for prevailing wage should be included or incorporated into the initial bid? Yes, it has to be. What okay. it says is is the wages that must be paid for a particular craft. You know, okay. and they vary from carpenters, laborers, iron workers, uh, mechanical trades, plumbers, electricians. You know, they're different. I see. But <clears throat> no matter where you're from, where, wherever the contractor, you have to pay that wage. It levels the playing field. It's not a race to the bottom. You're not bidding on a job by how poorly you could treat your employees. I see. You, well, how, you're well, getting how, your job on on the skills of your employees. I see and, what you're saying. Okay, so and you're also not bidding the job on 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 taking away quality from the particular contract at issue. No, you're I mean not. You're, you're basically saying that you you have a responsibility to build the best the best facility or the best structure that you can build, and to use the most qualified people to do it. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, That's go on. Exactly. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, no, you. no, no. You ask me all the questions you want. Okay. And so you know, in West Virginia, as a lot of her, well, I don't know, you know, where people are from listening. Uh, these bills have come up every year, but you know, for the last eighty-three, uh, we've had a, a Democratic-controlled legislature, and. You know, bills that try to eliminate prevailing wage, uh, well, they never get out of committee. So it's never been an issue. Well, in 2014, all of that changed. The I Republican see. Party now controls both the Senate and the House. Mm -hmm. And even though we have a Democratic governor, or, well, I call him a so-called Democratic governor, but that's my own personal thing. We don't have a, you know, like people go, well, the governor will veto it. Well, we really don't have a veto law like other states. I think we're one of uh, very few states that, <clears throat> unless it's a budgetary item, the governor's veto can be overridden by a simple majority. Okay. So if these people pass this, it's going to be law. If they pass it, they can override a veto. Yeah. All they have to okay. do is vote on it again. You know, if they have 51 saying. votes to pass it, all they got to do is vote again and get 51 votes. That's, a simple majority I see. I see veto overridden. And, you know, so... Wayne, Wayne can I ask you a question? Um, yeah. And I don't know, maybe, maybe this isn't the point you want to deal with this, but... Uh, you mentioned that the issue that legislation has come up year after year to eliminate prevailing wage legislation, and that uh, Democratic majorities have always been able to kill it. What on what basis do the defenders of those who would repeal prevailing wage? Um, what is what is the basis of their case? In other words, what's the argument they use that justifies the elimination of prevailing wage? that they could do so much more with the money. The president of the new president of the Senate is a, name, a gentleman named Senator Bill Cole. Uh -huh. He makes statements that if we eliminate prevailing wage, we could build five schools for the price of three, of what it costs today. We could okay. build five schools. Uh, the governor... Earlier last year, they had a, uh, a blue ribbon commission to how are we going to find money for highway projects. And there were meetings all over the state. I went to the local meeting here. We had a House of Delegates member from Mercer County, which is, well, you know, very close to here, who stands up at the meeting and he has a sign. One side of the sign says stop, the other side says slow. He stands up and he said, you've seen these guys out on the highway. He said, these guys get $35 an hour. And people gasp. Then he goes on to say, we can build all the schools and uh, public facilities we want, and we could build all the miles of highway we want, and we don't have to raise any taxes. All we have to do is eliminate prevailing wage. Well, then the next sentence out of his mouth is that the labor cost on a construction job is approximately 25% of the cost of a job. Mm -hmm. So I was the next speaker in line, and I got up... <clears throat> His name is Marty Gerhardt, Representative Gerhardt. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember him. He ran 18 times before he got elected. Yeah, I do remember. And I think he, somebody died and he got appointed. Uh, anyway, I stood up and I said, well, you know, like um, your math doesn't work, uh, Representative Gerhardt. It doesn't work. As number one, even if we had slave labor and you know what a smart ass I could be. I said, even if we had slave labor, which I think a lot of you and your people would prefer, I said, if you save 25% of job, 
if you build three schools, you only have 75% of the next school. Where yeah. do you get the next two for free? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense. That's right. If you cut the wage in half, well, then you're saving 12.5% per school. How many schools does that take you to get one for free? And then what are the quality of those schools? What's the cost overruns on those schools and delays? You know, it just doesn't work. And mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is there's been study after study after study that eliminating prevailing wage on publicly funded projects does not drive down the cost of doing that project. The, the, the cost of building a school remains the same. The only difference is the craftsmen are working for a third of what they used to, and the contractor is putting more money in his pocket. And that's, that's been proven time and time again. That's the issue I was going to ask you about, is, is all of the arguments in favor of eliminating prevailing wage no, tend, to, tend to assume that the money saved from reducing the cost of labor will be deducted from the total cost of the project. But the fact of the matter is that's an assumption. And it yep. seems to me that if I'm the one that, that's writing the making the bid, if I'm the, 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 the CEO of the contracting company that's bidding on the project, I'm, I'm going to profit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pocket whatever money I can save. Uh, you know, in, in other words, there's nothing to require me to put that savings back into the overall cost of the project itself. No, nothing at all. Nothing okay. at all. And, you know, it gives, though, well, then it gives non-union contractors an unfair advantage over union contractors. Union contractors are paying, and, you know, the prevailing wage turns out to be pretty close to what the union scale is. Mm -hmm. Because in our law, collective bargaining, uh, information or, you know, figures and, and wages are allowed to be included in the calculation to determine what the prevailing wage is. Right. Okay, so now if we don't have prevailing wage, a non-union contractor knows where the union contractor is going to be. He knows what they have to pay for a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber or iron worker, bricklayer, on and on and on. He knows right. it. Right. All he has to do is be 1% under that, and he gets the job. Only now, he employs people that are getting paid a third of what that union craftsman is getting. And it's, uh, we just, the organization that I work for, uh, which is the Affiliated Construction Trades, which is an arm of West Virginia State Building Trades, unions. Mm -hmm. We represent union people. Right. And we just commissioned a study, and, well, we commissioned it months ago. We've been after this guy for years because he's written a lot of different studies on prevailing wage and different issues throughout the country. He's a very busy man. And finally, we got him to do it, and we just got the study. And his name is Michael P. Kelsey, K-E-L-S-A-Y. He's a right. Ph.D. from the University of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a research associate and instructor, Department of Economics. His study shows that in West Virginia, that West Virginia builds elementary schools for $6.10 per square foot cheaper than Ohio, North Carolina, and Virginia, who do not have prevailing wage laws. Now, on a secondary school, uh, well, when I was going to school, it's junior high school, high schools, Right. West Virginia construction workers, and this isn't just union construction workers, this is West Virginia construction workers, because there are many non-union companies that build schools. Union, right. you know, union companies don't build them all. Yeah. On secondary schools, 
West Virginia construction workers build schools for $22.37 per square foot cheaper than North Carolina, Ohio, and Virginia who do not have prevailing wage laws. Now, my saying is don't fix what ain't broke. We're already cheaper. Our people enjoy a living wage that allows them to provide health insurance for themselves and their family. It allows them to contribute to a pension fund that will allow them to retire with dignity. When these people retire, they do not become burdens to society. They don't need food stamps. They don't need help on medical insurance because they have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they support they support their local businesses, their local churches, schools. They pay taxes, and you know that's another effect of this. By repealing this, the state of West Virginia is going to lose millions. It's in the study here. Mm-hmm. I forget. I exact. I I'd have to go through. Uh, right tell you the exact number, but it's millions of dollars that we'll lose just in taxes that, you you know, construction workers pay. Yes. Plus, you cut the wages like that. I mean, you know, and keep in mind, $40 an hour sounds like a horrendous amount of money. Well, you know, a, a union guy gets twenty five in his check, seven fifty goes to health insurance for him and his family, seven fifty goes to pension. Mm-hmm. So if the guy worked all year, if he worked fifty two weeks a year, he ends up making, you know, fifty, fifty two thousand dollars. You're gonna tell me that's outrageous? Yeah. And most construction workers don't work all year. Mm-hmm. And you know, these people talk out of both sides of their mouth. Bill Cole, the new Senate president, makes statements that we want good-paying jobs. We want to keep our children in West Virginia. We don't want them to have to get on the hillbilly highway to go out of state to make a living. And then in the next move, their plan is to eliminate the, you know, I don't know, 10, 20, 25,000 good paying jobs that we have. Right. And uh, it just doesn't make sense. But I see. You I know, see. I, I, well, I'll, I'll say for me, I don't want to get you in a trap, but I've noticed that dealing with Republicans' facts really don't matter. Uh, you know, they're <laughs> kind of anti facts. And, well, uh, I- uh, that's true when it comes to climate change. I know that. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. And, well, you know, wait, uh, well, and this isn't the only. I mean, they're you know they're attacking working people. I mean, you know, there's a bill for charter schools, and well, you see the infamous uh, 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 used car bill. They now got to have a bill going through the Senate that eliminates guarantees on a used car. Right. That's right. You know, the lemon law, you know, that, I mean, and a lot of people don't understand, you go buy a used car and they sell it to you as is, you still have 30 days to return that car. You could right. bring it back and say, within 30 days, this isn't a good car. It's falling apart. I want my right. money back. This law, if they pass it, eliminates that. Right. And, and I saw the I saw Mr. Cole, the the, the Senate President you referred to, uh, interviewed on television, and his argument in ra- in defense of that particular legislation was that it would make it easier for poor people to buy a vehicle so they could get to work. And yeah. and and I'm I'm stymied to figure out how that works if. If the car you buy has no guarantees, uh, if you you know if you basically buy it as is and are stuck with it no matter what you got, how does that help you, the the consumer? It and, doesn't. And help you. It doesn't. It doesn't. The only person that helps is Senator Cole. 
because Wait. he owns, what, four or five car dealerships. Car dealerships. I mean, talk about a conflict of interest. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that particular and, you know, we're piece not of dying, legislation. You know. Yeah, that particular piece of legislation is right is right where he right where he lives. Wayne, um, what kind of reaction are you getting to your arguments? Um, you know, what are the prospects of being able to 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 stop this leg this effort to eliminate prevailing wage in West Virginia? I mean, is the is the fact that the Republican Party has a one vote majority in its Senate? Is that going to prevail? In other words, are all are all members of the Republican Party in the Senate going to vote in tandem, or are there some members of the Senate that you feel might actually um, respond to the argument that you the case that you're making? Well, I I, I think we have a, cha uh, a chance of stopping it uh -huh. because you know, well, like what they do, and, and you know, this is my experience and. When Bill Cole and Mitch Carmichael, who is another senator and, and members from the House, like the Gearhart guy I was telling you about before, they, they are, I mean, they hate unions. They are anti-union. So when they see the words prevailing wage, the next word they see is union. Whether it's there or not, that's what they see. And they, their goal thing or thinking is, if we eliminate prevailing wage, we eliminate the unions. Right. Now, that is not true, but that's what they think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what we've done is is attacked it. You know, the people that I work for, and you know, some of them are pretty smart. I I have problems with some of them also. But yeah. we went to the business community. We went to our contract and had our contractors write letters, and they're down in the uh, Capitol building as we speak, lobbying these senators and House members and telling them, you're going to put me out of business. Because what happens, if you eliminate prevailing wage, then we are going to have a lot of low wage and, in my opinion, immoral out-of-state contractors come in here to underbid our contractors, right. and they're going to bring in low-wage workers, probably many of them illegal, mm -hmm. and uh, and West Virginia. You know, then our contractors are going to end up going bankrupt. Right <clears throat> now, the other thing is, like I say, when they see prevailing, then they see union. Well, they don't consider the thousands of construction workers that work on prevailing wage jobs that don't belong to a union. And I were trying to contact those people also and tell them, get a hold of your representative. And many of these people voted to put these people in charge mm -hmm. for other issues besides this. You know, well, yeah. you know all the... Yeah. You know, hot right. button issues, right. abortion, right. gays, right. Right. guns. Right to life and all that stuff, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we're having these people contact their senators and tell them, look, I voted for you, but I didn't vote for this. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to see what's happening. What yeah. you know, all this is very, you know, this is only the second week of the session. We started, what, the 14th. Right. And, uh... If it, to be honest with you, it's scary. You know, uh, there probably is going to be some uh, compromise where, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, I, you know, uh, it probably wouldn't be a bad compromise. You know, when the law was written in 32, it was 25000 and above. Well, $25,000 was a lot of money in 1932. Mm -hmm. It no longer is. Right. So, you know, maybe that ought to be a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, maybe that's where the compromise lies. I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Maybe there will be no compromise. They'll just pass what they want, and that'll be it. But yeah. we'll have to see, you know. And, uh, well, we're just, we're going to have to see. We have hope for the best and, and see what we can do. You know, like our, uh, one of the fears of raising the limit is that then people will do, you know, 
say they're going to build a million dollar project, well, they'll do it in four phases to avoid sure. paying the wage. Right. You know, and, yeah. You it, know. Yeah. In other words, they'll but they'll, they'll skirt. They'll skirt the spirit of the law in order to try to live within the letter of the law. Exactly. But if, okay. if, if people are compromising in good faith, there could be, you know, things put in there that would safeguard against that. Wayne, one of the things that, that I'm curious about, and, and, and I don't know whether, and I'm not meaning, uh, I'm not meaning you personally, but I'm, I'm using, I'm talking to you. But is there evidence do you have evidence that construction jobs performed by union labor, quality-wise, are substantially better? In other words, are there contra There are reasons why contractors deal with union construction on 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 jobs, and and sure. I, I mean, you know, I mean, we we all, I mean, we know that it makes perfect sense, but. But I'm wondering if there's evidence, because when we talk about wage, when we talk about wage, we're basically implying that the bottom line cost per hour for the labor is the most important thing. But it seems to me when you're talking about schools, you're talking about buildings that are going to house our teachers and our children. And, and the quality of the structure and the viability of the structure to withstand severe weather and wind and all of these other things, it seems to me, it seems to be the priority. The most dangerous thing about this is not, to me, is not necessarily just that the contractors will, pof, will pocket the money that they saved uh, by eliminating prevailing wage, but in the process, they're going to build structures that won't last, that'll fall down, that'll be unsafe, and it seems to me that's the real threat, or that's a part of the story. I, I think that, you know, that would be part of the consequences of repealing this law. And yeah. also in, you know, training still. I mean, you know, these laws allow, uh, you know, the union trades spend millions of dollars a year. I, I mean, I'm talking in West Virginia. If you do the whole country, you're talking billions. Yeah. But I, we spend millions of dollars a year training our people through apprenticeship programs, through uh -huh. continued education, continued training for journeymen, journeyman upgrade classes. All of our people, union people, and we finally got this law passed uh, in West Virginia. <clears throat> We've been, union trades in West Virginia have been drug testing our people since 1991. You, you know, you have to pass, we have a, you have to pass a yearly drug test, you get issued a card. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that card's good for a year. Now, some of our contractors, you get on that job, if your card's three months old, uh, you're going to take another test. That's just, they don't buy it, you know. Right. You, they want a current thing. And... You're subject to a random test at any day of the week, uh, or any day you're working, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, our, the national average of drug use on a construction job is between 12 and 17 percent. In West Virginia, it's less than one because of our programs. And a few years ago, we've got the state we passed the law and, or got it, you know, supported and lobbied for a law that on any publicly funded project that there had to be a drug policy. The contractor, regardless if they were union or non-union, had to have a drug-free policy and their people were required to have drug tests. Mm -hmm. You know, and although, you know, safety training, all those things are very important, and we do that, and the prevailing wage laws allow for that to be done because the funds are provided for that. So, Well, well, the drug issue, I mean, we all know, it, you know, and I, I guess it's true in all states, but I know here in West Virginia was, with jobs being at such a premium that the drug issue is an important one. I mean, I, I've talked to employers, not necessarily contract construction, people, but I've talked to employers 
uh, uh, small business people when they open a business who will oftentimes recruit double the number of employees they feel they ultimately need because they're anticipating that 50 to 60 percent of the people that apply are not going to be able to pass a drug test. And I've, so, I've you know, I mean, what you thing. what you bring, which is a guarantee of a drug-free workplace, it seems to me is is a very valuable asset, not only in terms of the of the the quality of the work being done, but also the quality of the structures being built. And, and, the and safety. It seems, yeah, the safety issue for children. I mean, I, I, I just, you know, I mean, to me, that's the real issue. Not the, not the saving of the dollars, but the safety of the, of, of the children. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, I mean, there are all sorts of other issues like the quality, you know, the extent to which our education system in West Virginia is keeping up with, with others. Um, you know, we, so far at least, are one of those states that have bought into the common core standards, whether we'll continue to be there with the new, the new majorities in the House and Senate here. I'm not sure. But at least at this point, um, you know, we're committed to Im- implementing the common core standards here in West Virginia. Well, and I, again, I don't know how long that'll last. So, so I, I think I you've got a very, a long time. <laughs> I, I, I think you've got a very, very strong case. I just, I, 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 I just, I, you know, I say, hope you're able and to I make say it. drugs, it's also alcohol too. You know, our sure. law is called the Alcohol and Drug Free Workplace Act. And and that's very it's very important to note that because I tell you I you know I worked non union construction jobs before I got in the union and yeah. I well I came here to build a federal prison in Beckley mm-hmm. and I you know every morning when I, I ran a crew I had a crew of seventeen guys and every morning I had to face a crane operator that I know closed the bar at, you know, four hours earlier. Right. And, you know, I when I was swinging in forms or materials, uh, all the guys that worked for me knew, you go over here, I'll guide them in, and I'll stay out of the way. Because yeah. I didn't know what the hell was going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So well, alcohol is also a very big, you know. Yeah, I don't sure. want I don't want to work with people who are stoned, and I don't want to work with people that are drunk either. Right, I understand. So, yeah. I understand. Well, Wayne, I, I I sure appreciate the time that you've given us. I mean, this is great information, and it's coming from somebody who really knows the knows the animal, so to speak. I mean, you obviously know what you're talking about, and I I, I just hope that that your your efforts are successful. I, and, and, I and hope they are too. And if there's now, anything, listen, Doctor. Yes, Go ahead. Wayne. I, I just I wanted to make a plug for the horn. Uh, I don't okay. know if we have new listeners or different listeners or whatever, but you know the history and that you know I. Well, we started this. It's going to be ten years. What October? I think. Uh huh. And you were have been a part of it since the beginning. And, right. And uh, you know we well we need money. We need contributions. And anybody that could help, you know, if you could sign up for a, you know, small monthly contribution to come out of your account or credit card or whatever, please go to the Horn website and, and make that happen. You know, we, everybody works for free and I forget how long we operated before we ask anybody for. I, well, I think it was shortly after I ran out of money. I don't know how many yeah. years that took. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need help because I think it's very important that this continue. Oh, and, it, I know uh, it is, and I and I, I, you know, I believe that, and I, I say it. I don't like to, I don't like to to over overemphasize that but I think most of the people listening know exactly what the situation is I mean we're not dealing with paid people here no, I mean these no people are doing this and when you talk about a labor of love that's what you're talking about here uh, very that's honestly exactly right. you a have lot of to people believe would call us crazy yeah that's right and that's why yeah. that's why it's so important we stay on because yes, it is. Because th- th- this is a voice that th- they, they they can't use money to get us off because there's no money involved. 
You know, they can't right. threaten us because we. what can they do? We, we don't have salaries to tap or any of that other stuff. So I, I, I'm serious. I mean, the fact that we're, you know, that, that, that we're doing this because we care and feel so strongly about what we're doing, I think gives us an element of strength that a lot of the people that we're addressing issues toward ha- can't deal with because they don't know how to deal with that. All the all the power issues that they usually have over people that criticize them don't apply to us. And That's and I exactly you know right. and I, I I think I think you're right. I think what we've got to do is is make sure that we have enough funding to keep the voice out there. Yes, and, and and you know this is very important right now because I mean all of our equipment that allows this to happen is on the verge of just quitting. I mean it's old. It's been patched, duct taped, bailing wire, the whole nine yards. We need new equipment, and that costs a lot of money. So right. anybody can but help. We'd surely appreciate it. There's been there's been occasion, as as our listeners know, that when when we've not done a live program, and I'll come in and say, you know, and I'll usually explain the ne- and the next time we're on by saying that we had technical difficulties, and of course those technical difficulties are that we're dealing with program with with equipment. That breaks down or is unreliable. Yeah, and we're doing, and we're doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can. Um, I know all about uh, being old. And I've broke down a couple of times. Why? Oh yeah, I'm still running pro- is another pro- miracle. You, pro- you probably will break down a couple of more times, but that's okay, buddy. You just get that's up and okay. keep going. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Ben. Yes. Wayne, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Doctor. This has been great. Talk thank to you, you later, sir. Buddy. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right, at, bye now. Okay, bye now. We're at 46 minutes after the hour, and uh, uh, the issue, it seems to me, there's no way that I could uh, make any clearer than Wayne has what the what the issues are here. I think he's he's pretty well covered the topic from, from one end to the other. Um, I, I will let you know that in yesterday's Charleston Gazette, which is the uh, st- you know the state paper in West Virginia. Um, in Sunday's Charleston Gazette, there was an editorial, an op-ed piece by Rick Wilson, in which addressed this very same issue that Wayne dealt with, with the which is the uh, commitment of the Republican majorities in House and Senate alike in West Virginia to abolish prevailing wage. And Rick Wilson makes a pretty good makes a pretty good case. He, he includes a lot of the information, a lot of the data about Davis Bacon and the other things that Wayne mentioned. So if anybody is interested in getting their hands on some hard data related to this, to this issue, then I would recommend that you go to the West Virgin- to the Charleston Gazette as, uh, on the internet. It's wvgazette.com and just look at yesterday, the 25th of January, on the, and just click op-ed when you get to the home page just click click op-ed and you will get the the op-ed pieces and the editorials beginning with today and then working backwards so you don't have to go far it was in yesterday's paper so it'll be the fourth or fifth piece down uh, and it seems to me that uh, you can get your hands on some pretty good information on this particular issue that way needless to say uh, I would love to hear from you on this issue if you have something to to contribute or to add, I was I was anticipating perhaps that somebody might have a call uh, for Wayne with with questions. I, I tried to anticipate uh, a few of the questions that some of you might have out there. I don't know whether I was able to do it successfully, but um, if you do have any questions, I would encourage you to share them. Uh, I would love to hear them and. Uh, I'll make sure that Wayne gets them as well, and I know Bob Kincaid will as well. Wayne is a regular um, participant and listener uh, on Bob Kincaid's program in the evening. Um, I see Wayne quite often here in southern West Virginia, uh, and so there's no question or no issue that you raise that will not get to him, and I'll do the very best I can either to get an answer myself or to bring uh, to bring Wayne back if if there's an issue uh, that he that you feel that he's neglected to cover and neglected to give uh, full attention to. Uh, but again, I think it's an important issue. Uh, well, I'll be honest with you. What frightens me um, is is it, while while this issue does frighten me quite a bit, 
um, especially with my interest in education. I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about this one. But I see so much simple similarity between what's happening here in West Virginia and what what's go, what's is happening and is going to be happening on the national level now that Congress is back in session. I think the reaction uh, to the President's State of the Union message last week uh, is an indication um, that that there's going to be a concerted effort from a variety of different re- sources and at a deri- variety of different levels. Uh, to undo much of what's what's been done in the past. Uh, let me say, and I think I would be remiss not to say this, that there's no question that some of what's been done in the past ought to be revisited and revised or remodeled or eliminated or whatever. I, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. But not all of it. Um, I don't think that you can presume that all of the legislation, the so-called social net legislation that has been passed over the years has been done so exclusively for partisan reasons. I think that's the implication, that the Democrats did this because they were trying to to feather their own partisan nest, and now that they're out and we're in, we can do so, undo some of the damage. Well, the fact of the matter is a lot of what's been done is not damage. A lot of what's been done is critical uh, to the survival of more and more people in this country. There's a, um, a study in today's New York Times, I believe, if not it's the Washington Post, it's probably in both, which documents the decline of the middle class in America. And it points out... <laughs> excuse me, brief cough spell there. The article points out that while initially in the 20th century, some of the decline of the middle class was based on the positive reality that many people from the middle class were moving into the upper middle classes and into the so-called upper class. The fact is, since the year 2000, the continued decline in the middle class has been because people are not going upwards, they're falling back into the lower class and and that has been exacerbated and while it's happening in many developed economies it's happening in much greater numbers here in the American economy because the inequality the level of inequality in America exceeds that in other nations and I think the philosophy the arguments that are being made in support of eliminating prevailing wage wage legislation here in West Virginia reveal the mentality of the ideology which is driving this whole debate not just here in West Virginia but nationally as well and the assumption is that you can get away with eliminating a lot of these things if you paint it as ideological in its in its origins the fact of the matter is much of what's been done is not done for ideological reasons it's done for human reasons for humanity reasons and great damage is going to be done if we just willy nilly eliminate everything that's been done because it was done by somebody else somebody with a D after their names rather than those with R after their names so I think I think this is a, a big issue and, and again the reason I wanted to uh, to hear from Wayne I'm so glad he was able to give us the better part of an hour today is because I think it's important that we get an inkling of the kinds of things that are happening so that all of us can can begin to gird our loins as, as it were to be able to respond in kind to some of these issues so I think they're very very important and I think all, we're in a very very uh, volatile situation here politically not only here in West Virginia but in the nation generally and I think the data suggests that you know when you look at the continued decline the precipitous decline of those people that are included within the so-called middle class and I think the people that have done this research have made very very generous 
have created very generous parameters for the middle class. They're basically saying that those who earn between $35,000 a year and $100,000 a year in today's society would be considered middle class. I think that's very generous. We, we, we know, for example, that many of us do not consider those who make in the neighborhood of $100,000 as middle class at all. To them, they're, to us, they're upper class. But the fact is, when you make a generous, put very generous parameters on your definition of a middle class, as this study has done, and then you begin to talk about the precipitous decline of the middle class, it, it seems to reinforce the idea that in this economy, the vast majority of the of the growth in the stock market is going in one direction while people's standard of living going in the other. I personally and I, I can I can say I don't like to say this, but I just I may drew this conclusion in my own personal case this morning. There's absolutely no question that while I was working in higher education, I've been in higher education for close to fifty years, while I was working there was no question that my profession basically made it possible for me, income-wise, to, to reside in the middle class. I've been retired now for just about a year, and the conclusion I reached this morning is that by retiring, I dropped from the, out of the middle class. And I find myself scurrying around trying to deal with the realities of that decline. Basically by redefining and reassessing my standard of living, what I can afford to keep, what I must give up. Uh, things like cable TV, cell phones, those kinds of things, it seems to me, uh, uh, are all things that are vulnerable. Are vulnerable. Um, these are things that I never thought about before. I just did because in my profession I needed them. I needed to know what was happening. I needed to uh, to have access to all of these different sources. But now I find that my income will not sustain that kind of interest. And so I've got to make some difficult choices. They're nothing compared to the choices that other people out there make, and I know that. But I think I'm personally in a situation where I'm able to realize the realities of what many people in this country are, are, are going through on different levels, of course. So again, I, I, I want to thank Wayne. I want to, appre I want to thank him for the time that he's been willing to give us, and I want to thank him for his efforts. Uh, please feel free if you have any questions or comments or, or suggestions or anything else that might that might help people better understand uh, this particular issue or the ways that this particular issue relates to perhaps larger and more significant issues on a national level. Please feel very, very comfortable to call us here at the Virtual Center and make yourself heard. Uh, again, our phone number, area code 304-663-4676. My email, my email address, waobrian906 at gmail.com. We've just about reached the top of our first hour today, uh, thanks in large part to Wayne and his call on prevailing wage. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, to pause for a few moments and take our regular break and then come back in our second hour. What I'd like to do is I'd like to re return to the issue uh, that we were dealing with the last time we were together, uh, which was the short story written by Ursula Le Guin entitled, The Ones Who Walk Away from Amalas. We'll do that when we come back. Thank you for tuning in to the Virtual Center. Uh, we'll pause for a five-minute break, uh, and we'll be right back. I invite you to stay with us, please. Thank you. We now return to the Virtual Center for the study of the Constitution and civic responsibility. Here's Dr. Bill O'Brien. 
Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to our second hour of the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. On this Monday, it is the 26th day of January in the year 2015. If you are just joining us, I want to welcome you to our program. Uh, I do want to say that you would be do well uh, to <clears throat> at, when you have time. If you hit, were not with us during the first hour, to uh, to go to the archive, whiterosesociety.org or YouTube, and pick up our first hour. We had Wayne calling in on the issue of prevailing wage and the efforts of the recently elected Republican-controlled legislature here in West Virginia to repeal prevailing wage legislation in this state. Uh, Wayne did, a, I, I think, a superb job in laying out the case, in pointing out the arguments uh, that those supporting this legislation um, uh, are using, uh, and and I think did a great job uh, in refuting it, and also citing some of the research uh, that he and others have done uh, to re pretty well shoot holes, it seems to me, through the rationale for the elimination of prevailing wage requirements here in West Virginia on public uh, construction construction jobs uh, the main the main one being of course schools more than anything else it's uh, it's schools that that we're dealing with here when we come to construction as it is in many other states as well I'm sure we would love to hear from you our phone number is area code 304-663-4676 that's 304-663-HORN H-O-R N. My email address, if you'd like to communicate directly with me, waobrien906 at gmail.com. waobrien, B-R-I-E-N, 906, all one word, at gmail.com. And let me say that if you, if you are interested in making a comment uh, or in adding something to the uh, uh, call that we had from Wayne last hour uh, and you're reluctant to call and you'd like to do it via email, I promise you that I will make sure that Wayne gets it. In fact, I will I will make it a point to forward your email directly to him if it's information that he should have as well as taking taking it to him personally the next time I see it, which is, see him, which is which is quite, which is quite often. Um I'm a little bit reluctant to put the prevailing wage issue to, to rest, as it were, because I think, I think it is so significant, uh, not only in its own right, but also for the uh, ideological implications that it seems to reveal, uh, not only here in West Virginia, but nationally. I think that, that what we're seeing here are the first, the first inklings, if you will, of an ideological trend uh, that we're going to be facing on a number of different levels. And I think all of us need to uh, need to be, not only be be prepared, but in, you know. And again, this is a probably uh, a political comment in part, but to be prepared. Uh, I think all of I think we're going to be forced to justify and defend many things that we've up until this point have been pretty much willing to take to take for granted by assuming that it'll always be there. I think we're going to find out that that's not necessarily not necessarily true. <laughs> In our last program, in fact, in our last four, three or four programs, we were dealing with uh, Ursula Legant's short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Amalas. And if you remember, we began this two weeks ago by looking at the David Brooks piece, which was based on this article. We looked at Brooks, we, we focused principally on Brooks's, what I think is excellent, cogent summary of the short story and and then we looked at the conclusions that Brooks reached as to the different levels on which you could look at this story and there's absolutely no question that it is the levels the issues that he wanted the story to reveal that seemed to be the thrust of what his op-ed piece was all about he wasn't just covering the story and summarizing it so that we would be familiar with the story. He was doing it 
because he had a particular objective or a particular agenda. There were certain things that he wanted us to know that were reinforced, supported, or explained by that story, and we looked at those. Then we began to look at the short story itself. And one of the things we noticed very, very quickly was that, understandably, there's no way that David Brooks's article could completely summarize, could deal with all of the issues, could fully encapsulate all that's in the short story. And we saw very, very quickly that there were a number of significant issues, issues that I think were significant, that Brooks's piece, Brooks's article or op-ed piece didn't touch at all. But again, that's not necessarily a criticism of Brooks because his purpose was different. He had a, he had an agenda. And he set out to support that agenda and he did it well. But it seems to me the message for us is that in order to get the full thrust of what primary sources offer us, it's absolutely essential that we go to the sources themselves rather than rely on secondary sources, rather than rely on people to tell us what's in these things we should be reading for ourselves. Because if you read, as an example, if you read David Brooks's piece about the ones who walk away from Amalas without consulting the story itself, you are going to leave, you are going to conclude that what David Brooks says about this particular short story is really all that there is that's relevant. The fact of the matter is that's not true. There's more in the story than David Brooks tells us. And if we want to get the full thrust, the full benefit of the story, we need to go to the primary source. I think that's the lesson that I think all of us need to take from this experience. And that's why I wanted to contrast Brooks's summary with the source itself. Not to criticize Brooks, but to help explain Brooks in a way which I hope makes clear what secondary sources are about as opposed to primary sources. And where this really, where this so-called rubber really hits the road, so to speak, is in our education system. Because we know that our education system focuses almost exclusively on secondary sources. It focuses on textbooks which tell us what the truth is. Or teachers who tell us what the truth is in any number of issues. Or the state curriculum guide, which tells us what the truth is. In other words, the one common theme seems to me that helps us really encapsulate our education system to a large degree is that what our youngsters have access to is driven primarily by secondary sources. And while there are benefits and advantages to secondary sources, they summarize, they help us separate the most important from the least important. They give us some idea as to whether this is a primary source we want to visit. The fact is that if all we get and all we know is information we derive from secondary sources, we are not in any way touching truth. What we are doing instead is looking at the way particular individuals define that truth. And if we want to find truth for ourselves, we've got to go do the grunt work, as it were, 
to find it, which means we've got to go back to the sources. And the reason that I think this is so important, and this isn't really the the, the focus of, of this hour, and I don't want to make this the focus of this hour, but it seems to me we all know the kinds of problems that our society faces in terms of our education system. The social problems, the abuse problems, the drug problems, the lack of skill problems, the lack of motivation problems, the attitudes that many of our youngsters bring uh, to our schools and the attitudes that they bring from our schools into society at large. We know that this society has many, many problems problems which we have traditionally looked to our schools to resolve. It is my sense, it is my belief, that a number of those could be addressed if we shifted our education in the classrooms more towards primary sources and less towards secondary sources. What that would involve would be a de-emphasis on right answers to questions and more emphasis on students reading and engaging materials which raise questions within them rather than answer meaningless questions posed to them by somebody else. Questions which have quantitative, measurable, fact-based answers. I think what we're looking at here in this short story, the ones who walked away from, walk away from Amalas, what we are looking at is some of the issues that reading the primary source, reading the short story itself would raise for us. Issues which Brooks can't, ra- can't include in his article, but issues that raise critical questions that all of us would do well to confront in reading this article for ourselves. With that, I'd like to, and this is a review because we dealt with this before, but again, it's been close to a week since we've been into this, so I don't want to just pick up from where we where we stopped a week ago and go on. That would, it seemed to me, to defeat, defeat our purpose here. Our purpose is not time. It's not the amount of material that we can say we covered. It's what we can learn from the materials we address. And so it seems to me that justifies going back and looking at what I think is the really important issue that Laguerre raises in this short story, which is reflecting a bit on the issue of happiness itself. The kind of happiness which the people of Amalas seem to be experiencing as opposed to the definition of happiness as we pursue it in today's world. The author, Ursula Le Guin, makes a major point, and none of this is in Brooks's summary, but the author makes a major point of distinguishing between the happiness that the people of Amalas seem to be experiencing and the way the rest of us in contemporary society seem to be unable to engage or to embrace that kind of happiness to the point that she even has to make the point about the people of Amalas that these are not simple people recognizing that our tendency today is to look at cultures look at people who live this way the way they live in Amalas and characterizing these people as simple folk as ignorant as backward as stupid as uncivilized or whatever. That seems to be a major part of her story. And to miss it 
by assuming that you get the whole thing from reading David Brooks's piece, it seems to me is an incredibly significant loss. I'm going to read a portion of the pe- of the short story. We looked at it before, but I want to repeat it again because I think it is so significant. When she opens and talks about the kind of things that are happening as the people of Amalas prepare for this festival and talk about the 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 kind of happiness and and joy and smiling and laughter and music and all of those things that we associate with happiness in the abstract. She concludes that section by saying, joyous? How is one to tell about joy? In other words, how do I describe joy to people who can't understand this approach or this kind of joy? How describe, she says, the citizens of Amalas, of Amalas? In other words, I'm talking to people that can't even understand what these people that I'm writing about are experiencing. How do I explain it, she says. And then she goes on and, and sets out to do it. And I'm quoting directly from the short story. These were not simple folk, you see, though they were very happy. But we do not say the words of cheer much anymore. All smiles have become archaic. Given a description such as this one, tends to make certain assumptions. Given a description such as this one, tends to look next to the king, mounted on a splendid stallion and a surrounded by his noble knights, or perhaps in a golden litter, borne by great muscled slaves. But there was no king. They did not use swords or keep slaves. They were not barbarians. I do not know the rules and laws of their society. So they also got on without the stock exchange, the advertisement, the secret police, and the bomb. In other words, what she's doing here is making a distinction between the lifestyle of the people of Amalas and the lifestyle that we all know and live in today's modern society, and she's trying to point out the difference. She goes on and says, Yet I repeat that these were not simple folk, not dulcet shepherds, noble savages, bland utopians. They were not less complex than us. The trouble is that we have a bad habit encouraged by pedants and sophisticates of considering happiness as something rather stupid. Only pain is intellectual to us. Only evil interesting. This is the treason of the artist. A refusal to admit the banality of evil and the terrible boredom of pain. If you can't lick them, join them. If it hurts, repeat it. But to praise despair is to condemn delight. To embrace violence is to lose hold of everything else. We have almost lost hold. We can no longer describe a happy man nor make any celebration of joy. How can I tell you about the people of Amalas, she says. She has made the distinction between the world and the way we define or seek happiness within it and the kind of happiness pursued and experienced by the people of Amalas. They were not naive and happy children, she says, though their children were, in fact, happy. They were, they were mature, intelligent, passionate adults whose lives were not wretched. Oh, miracle! But I wish I could describe it better. 
I wish I could convince you. Amala sounds in my words like a city in a fairy tale, long ago and far away, once upon a time. Perhaps it would be best if you imagined it as your own fancy bits, assuming it will rise to the occasion, for certainly I cannot suit you all. In other words, what she's saying is, let's see if we can relate the elements of our society to that one. Let's see if by looking at our society we can begin to understand theirs. For instance, she says, how about technology? I think that there would be no cars or helicopters in and above the streets. This follows from the fact that the people of Amalas are happy people. In other words, given that they are really genuinely happy, then there probably are not cars and helicopters hovering overhead and everything else. Happiness is based on a just discrimination of what is necessary, what is neither necessary nor destructive, and what is destructive. In the middle category, however, that of the unnecessary but undestructive, that of comfort, luxury, exuberance, they could perfectly well have central heating, subway trains, washing machines, and all kinds of marvelous devices not yet invented. Not yet invented here. Floating light sources, fuelless power, a cure for the common cold. In other words, what she's saying is they could well have these, but these are not the things that really distinguishes their way of life from ours, their, their view of happiness from ours. Or, she says, they could have none of that. It doesn't matter. As you like it. In other words, whatever makes you happy. I incline to think that people from towns up and down the coast have been coming into Amalas during the last days before the festival on very fast little trains and double-deck trams. In other words, I'm perfectly comfortable saying, yeah, they may have had trains, and I, I think maybe they did come in, in trains. And that the train station of Amalas is actually the, the handsomest building in town. In other words, I can concede you that, that the, the train station is the most elaborate, beautiful building in town, still doesn't change the differences that we've, that we've looked at. But even granted trains, she said, I fear that Amalas so far strikes some of you as goody-goody. Even if we acknowledge that it could have washing machines and, and some of these things, I still get the feeling that some of you see Amalas as goody-goody. Smiles, bells, parades, horses, blah. Okay. If so, she says, please add an orgy. If an orgy would help, don't hesitate. In other words, the kinds of things that we associate in our world today, if you want to put them in there, see if that helps. I'm willing to concede that, she says. And later on, it, further down, she talks about, I think there ought to be beer. What else belongs in the joyous city? She talks about the things that could be there without changing it, but she also suggests the things that shouldn't be there, like soldiers, clergy. She's not talking about people not being religious, but she said, we did it without clergy. Let us do it without soldiers. And she's beginning to distinguish between that way of life and ours. Because now she wants to know whether, in fact, we see the difference that she's trying to convey to us. Do you believe, she says, do you accept the festival, the city, the joy? No? Then let me describe one more thing. And this is where we left off. Because this one more thing is going to be the thing that is the subject of David Brooks's entire effort to address this short story. 
Here is the one more thing. In a basement, under one of the public, beautiful public buildings of Amalas, or perhaps in the cellar of one of its spacious private homes, there is a room. It has one locked door and no window. A little light seeps in dustily between cracks in the boards, second hand from a cobweb window somewhere across the cellar. In one corner of the little room, a couple of moths, mops, M-O-P-S, mops, with stiff, clotted, foul-smelling heads stand near a rusty bucket. The floor is dirt, a little damp to the touch, as cellar dirt usually is because of the humidity. If, If any of you who have basements, you know what I'm talking about. Most people with basements need dehumidifiers because they tend to become very musty. And if the floor is dirt, it becomes damp. The room is about three paces long and two paces wide. A mere broom broom closet or disused tool room. In the room, a child is sitting. It could be a boy or a girl. It looks about six but actually is nearly ten. It is feeble-minded. Perhaps it was born defective, or perhaps it has become imbecile through fear, malnutrition, and neglect. It picks its nose and occasionally fumbles vaguely with its toes or genitals as it sits hunched over in the corner furthest from the bucket and the two mops. It is afraid of the mops. It finds them horrible. It shuts its eyes, but it knows the mops are still standing there. And the door is locked, and nobody will come. The door is always locked, and nobody ever comes, except that sometimes the child has no understanding of time or intervals. Sometimes the door rattles terribly and opens and a person or several people are there. One of them may come in and kick the child or make it stand up. The others never come close but peer in at it with frightened, disgusted eyes. The food bowl and the water jug are hastily filled. The door is locked. The eyes disappear. The people at the door never say anything. But the child, who has not always lived in the tool room and can remember sunlight and its mother's voice, sometimes speaks. I will be good, it says. Please let me out. I will be good. They never answer. The child used to scream for help at night and cry a good deal. But now it only makes a kind of whining Iha, Iha, and it speaks less and less often. It is so thin there are no calves to its legs. Its belly protrudes. It lives on a half bowl of cornmeal and grease a day. It is naked. Its buttocks and thighs are a mass of festered sores as it sits in its own excrement continually pretty graphic description of the living conditions, the miserable living conditions that this child is confined to. Now she goes back to the people of Amalas. They all know it's there, all the people of Amalas. Some of them have come to see it. Others are content merely to know it's there. They all know that it has to be there. Some of them understand why, and some do not. But they all understand that their happiness, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their friendships, the health of their children, the wisdom of their scholars, the skill of their makers, even the abundance of their harvest and the kindly weathers of their skies, depend wholly on this child's abominable 
misery. I think this paragraph is where we closed the last time we were dealing with this article. The people of Amalas all knew about this room. They all knew about this child. Some of them had seen it. Some of them were content just to know that it was there. They all know that it has to be there. And again, I made this point before, but I can't overemphasize. Notice the fact that the author continually refers to this child as an it. Not a boy, not a girl, not he, not she, but it. I think that's very significant. Because in the eyes of the people of Amalas, indeed, it is. it has become, it is an it. A question. Every time I read this, I think of additional points or come up with additional questions. When the author says that they all understand that their happiness, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their friendships, the health of their children, the wisdom of their scholars, the skill of their makers, even the abundance of their harvest and the kindly weathers of their skies. All of these things depend wholly on this child's abominable misery. I ask you to think about why the author believes that that is true. Why do the people of Amalas believe that everything that they take, everything they enjoy, everything that they define as part of happiness depends wholly on this child's abominable misery. Why would she say that? If it's true that all the people of Amalas attribute everything good in their lives to this particular child's misery, where did that come from? Why do they believe that? Is this something that each of the people of Amalat have worked out and reasoned for themselves? Or is it something that somebody probably has told them is true? I guess what I'm asking is, is this an aspect of what we would attribute or what we would term faith in these people? Has the existence of this child and the link between the misery in which it lives and the happiness which the people experience outside that room has the connection between the two or the interdependence of the two been taught to them? Has it been emphasized? Do they just believe it even if they don't understand why? Because the question that I would ask is, why are these things interdependent? And I think if we think about it, we think about our own world, our own day-to-day life, don't most of us conclude? I mean, we even have cliches to address the matter. That's the way life is. Hey, Bill. Yes, Bob. May I ask a question, please? Sure. Does uh, uh, does the author say that the people know that it is that, that, that their happiness depends upon her, or or the it? I'm sorry. See, yeah. I'm proje- I'm projecting gender. Okay. Um, 
does she say that that the people know it or that they believe it? And I, I ask this because she is not uh, Ursula Gwyn. Ursula Le Guin is not an incautious user of words. No, that that's a good question, Bob. What she says is they all understand it, but that doesn't answer the question you raise. Do they understand it because they make they have reasoned it out for themselves, That's, or do they understand it because somebody has told them it's because true? Because they believe it, right? I, I, because they you know, believe it. Time after time after time over the course of these long ten years, I have asserted that the most dangerous word in the English language is believe. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, 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 and you know why I say that? Yeah, I know. I do. I believe the same thing. Um. Because when she says understand, when we see the word understand, it implies some sort of a cognitive process that we've gone through. But the fact of the matter is, many of us understand certain things without any cognitive background at all. We just accept as truth what people have always told us to be true. Well, but, yeah, it, uh, for instance, based upon our conversation from last week, uh, lottery in June, corn heavy soon. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. That you tend to make connections and say, basically, look at how happy we were. Any change that we might make, like doing something about the living conditions of this child, might jeopardize all the other good things that we have going for us. Therefore, the best option for us is to do nothing. Well, I mean, the, it, it raises, her, her, her speculative universe raises so many questions. The child looks six, but is closer to ten. What happens when the child, uh, how long does the child survive? Yeah. Do they have to go and, do they have to go and get another child? Get, that's what I was going to say. Do they need to find another one? Do they need to have another one in the wings? And does that have? Do they have to go and get another one because that one dies? Or do they eventually? They, but but it's been it's been it's uh, the the the, de the the sensory deprivation has apparently had a profound effect on it. So it's never going to be one of those happy people of the city, is it? No, it's never going to be. And. And the implication, uh, you know, I mean, when you if you think about the questions you're asking, Bob, the implication is if this child died, they could substitute another one, and most people would never know that anything had happened. Because the child's miserable condition, most of them can't look at it except that with, with disgust. So the chances are that if there was a, a switch made, they wouldn't even know it but it would reinforce the belief system which suggests but that every, but everyone there understands that this is a necessity does that mean that the child is being taken from their own population or from outside it it doesn't it's the only thing she says is that at some point in time um the child has not always lived in the tool room and can remember sunlight and its mother's voice. Sometimes speaks, I will be good, please let me out, I will be good. They never answer and, the, and eventually the child stops asking. And so what, what they're doing is breaking the spirit of that child and turning it into an it by the very conditions that it's living in. And somehow they're sending the message to people that this is the reason why all the good things in their lives are there. And people are willing to make that connection. And so therefore they never question it. Many of them don't even want to see that child. They just accept the fact that it's there. But the one thing that they wouldn't consider is change because they really don't know what eliminating the conditions that this child is living in, what the effect would be on their lives. And rather than find out, they're much more comfortable rationalizing 
the existing the existing status quo as it were i mean it's 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 unbelievable you're right it raises a lot of a lot of questions um it bob as far as whether it comes from this from this community or from outside does it matter you know as miserable as the child's existence is well i i think it does matter Okay, go ahead. Tell, tell, explain why, because I'm, I'm, I'm not with you here. Go ahead. Because if the child is coming from within the within the within the community, mm-hmm. that means that some parents or parent, remember, the child can recall the sound of its mother's voice and knows the, knows sunlight. Then, then, then a parent has been deprived of the child, which means that at least. Uh, the, uh, for at least one parent, what you're the sacrifice the sacrifice involved is not um, esoteric, and there would be people that would remember the child before it was condemned to that room, right? And and so basically, what we're what we're saying basically is that memory and and history, if you will, is is being eliminated or overlooked or, or whatever here because she's not she's not dealing with that but I think the point you raise is a good one I was saying given the conditions of the child you know where it came from wouldn't matter but it would matter you're right in terms of the parent who gave up the child as well as the people who knew that child before the parent gave it up but you know, I think I, I think that it's a it's an incredible statement about pe- people's willingness to accept the status quo, whatever it is, and build their world around that around the reality of what they think is real, what they think is true. And I I, I just find that frightening. But I you know, well, it it is it is frightening because I I think I, I think. I don't know if we're supposed to, or if she had, some, uh, if she had something much more uh, concrete in mind as to the the conclusion she wanted us to reach. I, I can't help thinking that she would. Uh, maybe she's happy, but I can't help thinking thinking that she would be appalled that David Brooks would pick this up. Yeah. Um, because David Brooks I, is such an apologist for right. Uh, ah, yeah, for I agree. Uh, yeah, I think we're we're in the, we're in tune on this one, Bob. Because, because I think I think that one of the most disturbing things about this is that if you remember the context of this, she's introducing this aspect of the story because she believes that this is going to be something that we can get our arms around, that we can handle, that we can understand. In other words, what she's done up until now is point out that most of the happiness that these people experience, we can't understand. But now she seems to be saying, let me add this. Now you can understand it. And what does that say about us? Well, I, that- I, yeah, and I think, I think it operates on a couple of levels. Um, on, on, uh, on one level, uh, it is, it, it, it is, it is a, a cautionary tale that, that, soci- that society does not want to look upon the sacrifices that it imposes but rather wants to focus on its magnificence. Mm-hmm. Um, on, uh, on, a, on a more personal on, level... Or, on, the or, extent, or, on the extent to which it is an exceptional society. Yeah. American exceptionalism. Indeed. Indeed. Or, there, or, or, and, or any sort of utopianism. Right. And so therefore you eliminate or refuse to deal with or acknowledge the circumstances or the realities of some of the people that aren't able to experience the joys that you experience, the happiness that you experience. And that's a tendency. I was thinking about this in terms of, of Wayne's call in our first hour about prevailing wage. Well, I'm, thinking, I'm, and, think, I'm thinking about this on a number of levels, but uh, I, th- I, think, I think what Wayne was talking about is, uh, certainly fits into this, into this analysis because we have... Uh, and and it's 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 a it's a sea change in american culture bill that 
where, whereby once upon a time we lived in an, Amer- in an America where everybody felt like everybody had a shot. Yeah. Now we live in an America where if uh, construction workers are uh, happen happen to make a living wage, uh, there is a, a significant plurality out there that says, well, why are they making $35 an hour? They need to be making $10 an hour like me. Yeah. That's right. And so what they're dealing, what they're doing is appealing to this mentality by suggesting that these people have ceased to live as if, as if work, like working people ought to be living. Because what they're saying is these people who are pretending to be middle class because of the income they make really aren't. Yeah, got no business, got no business being. They're above their raisin. Exactly. So it's time we basically bring them back to where they belong. Yeah. And they were appealing to a to an, a, a public sense or they they they're appealing to a public that into which this is so ingrained that many people are believing it just like the people of Amalas believe that their happiness is somehow tied to the misery of this child. They don't know why. But they just do, and the and and the thing is, as long as you don't change anything, you don't have to worry about that. As long as you just, you know, keep things going the way they are. And and this idea, you made made the 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 statement about people living above their raising, uh, their raising. That's really, it seems to me, what bothers a lot of people. I'm I'm struck by this, uh, Joseph Warren. Um, comment at the time of the American Revolution that there are people r- driving around in carriages who fi- you know, who s- a few years ago weren't worthy to, sh- to shine my shoes. Who do they think they are? Who the hell do they think they are? Well, and, 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 and look, at, well, look, at the, look at the way in this country, the old and I think the same applies in maybe the UK, maybe a few other countries. Uh, look at the way that old money looks at new money. I mean, we've even got a word for them now, don't we? The nouveau riche. Nouveau riche. And right. they are, and they are, they are tacky, and they don't know which fork to use with the shrimp. But they've yep. got a lot of money. Right. Um, the the Rodney Dangerfield character in right. uh, in 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 uh, uh, Caddyshack comes to mind. So so the best thing we can do for them is make sure that they can they never have to face that problem because they won't be able to afford shrimp. Right. You know, if we take if we take the ability to eat shrimp away from them, then we eliminate the contradiction. We eliminate the problem. Oh man, Bob, Woo! this is this is heavier than I thought. But the funny the funny thing is, um, we're not uh, we uh, the 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 people who reach nouveau riche status. Well, you know they get along. It's this. It's this idea, and and uh, we saw it. We saw it when there was trouble in the car industry. Well, why are those auto workers making thirty five dollars an hour? That's right. You know they stole it, and it's coming from public. You know, it, 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 in other words, they use their power to to wrest these concessions. When when in point of fact, it was Henry Ford. You know, Henry Ford didn't invent the automobile, but he in, invented. The assembly line method, more or less, yep. and the and the and the means by which they could become ubiquitous. Henry Ford realized he was never going to uh, get where he wanted to go, being a boutique industry. He had to be. He had to become uh, a phenomenon. Right. So you had to. And, yeah. And and the way you do that is you associate the driving of an automobile with freedom. And the more you can link those two. And you make it, it possible so that for the people's mind. You can't be free unless you own an automobile. Well, exactly. And and by the same token, if your workers can't buy your cars, you're getting it wrong. So uh, he made he made it possible for the people who were building his cars to buy one of his cars to buy one of their own products. Exactly. And 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 thereby elevated them, I suppose, to a certain extent. I saw a video the other day, I posted it on my Facebook page, that quantified a human life as a number of jelly beans. The average human life is something over the average human life is something over twenty eight thousand jelly beans. And
and then through stop action, they began removing numbers, percentages of the jelly beans based upon stuff we do with our lives. Mm-hmm. And there was a whole bunch of jelly beans that was nothing but sitting in a car commuting. Mm-hmm. Now, this, uh, fully, this is an interesting. Now, fully one third of the jelly beans were taken up in sleep, mm-hmm. and that just you know that just comes with being a human. Sorry, you yeah. got to do it. Yeah, everybody does that. But it's it's the discretionary stuff. There was yeah. Uh, there there was a pile of jelly beans that was uh, civic life, and religious life, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and but and and the commute, and the time we spend feeding ourselves, and the time we attend bathing and dealing with hygienic functions, and by the time by the time that that all got sorted out, the pile of jelly beans that actually was life was minuscule. Mm-hmm. And so my thought was to look at that and say, mm, look at that. You know, the first thing that came to me, look at that commute. Because yeah. because uh, you have taught me over the course of the years to just, I mean so did Jefferson did Madison spend that much of their lives in that no hell no no were their lives less meaningful I think it's very fairly obvious that as compared to most of ours they were far more meaningful that's right that's right uh, or or and and I was I also channeled our buddy Doctor John. Because I started thinking about hunter-gatherer societies, mm-hmm. who ha- who have been demonstrated scientifically over the uh, paper after paper after paper to have far more leisure time than any of us will ever even dream of. Right. And and I don't mean to have taken this so far afield, but I believe that no. I believe that it all weaves back in. It, it, in it, Robin, it at the end of World War One in 1917. The National Education Association redefined the objectives of public education for the masses. And there were seven of them. And one of them was the worthy use of leisure time. And, 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 And basically the argument was that the worst thing we can do is allow technology to create more and more leisure time for people without teaching people how to take it, how to use leisure. What they can do and what they can't do, what they should do, what they shouldn't do, etc. And that was one of the objectives of our public education system, is to basically address the issue of the worthy use of leisure time. It was one of the seven objectives of public education endorsed by the National Education Association. My God. And basically what they're saying is there are certain people over whom society must have total control over all their time because they are untrustworthy unless we can rest assured that we know how they're going to use what they have, what the, the freedoms that our society gives them. It's, it's, it's amazing. And, and, yet, and, and yet directed freedom is not freedom. No, not, not, in the, not, not the way we define it, no. I mean, I, su- but, I, I but suppose if you if you, I, if you define freedom as 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 Jefferson and some of the philosophers of the Enlightenment did, freedom being the ability, the the the, the flexibility to do things for other people and to improve the quality of other people's lives. That, but that that that's a, a that's a definition of freedom that nobody wants to buy into. Or working and living within the community. Yeah. Making yeah. the community better and thereby making one's one's own existence making one's better. Making one's own existing better, but people don't want that. That's Bob. That's communism. It most, is, I guess, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is, Bob. I, I hate to say it, but we're at fifty-eight minutes after the hour, and I'm just getting warmed up here. Yeah, I know, I know. God but, and, and, uh, but I couldn't resist jumping in. I got to go read. Oh, this. thank you. I got to go read this story. I, I just well, do. listen. Uh, I'm going to be back with it tomorrow. So I, I you know, um, I just I can't resist. I can't wait for the next issue. You know, it's just it's just great. My God, Bob, thank you. Uh, thank, and I want to thank Wayne and and thank all those people. I hope you you all enjoyed this as much as I have. I found thank you, I found this to be two stimulating hours, and and again the stimulation comes 
from the ideas and to play with ideas and reflect and wonder. It's just so exciting. It's called education. And I think the more, the more of it I get, the more of it I want. I hope you agree. It's 59 minutes after the hour. Rick Smith's getting ready to fire up at 3 p.m. here in the East. So I want to thank you all for tuning in, and I want to invite you to tune in tomorrow. Remember, tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll start one half hour later than we did today. We'll begin at 1.30 in the East. It'll be a 90-minute total program rather than, uh, r- rather than the regular two-hour program. Thank you. Have a wonderful time. Be safe. Be very conscious of the weather and take care of each other. This is Bill O'Brien. Thank you.